Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to make sure you know all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on all new episodes of Wade's World, Boob Windows and Long Boxes, our hard R movie reviews, and so much more, all completely uncensored. Access starts for as little as $1 a month, full videos when you pledge $3 a month. Check us out at the link in all of our show notes, or just go straight to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. kids welcome back to another episode of the the devil you know the daredevil podcast so of course i am phil that is lilith and it's that time again another chat with our good friend mr dg chichester hello sir hello guys how are you both how have you been everybody well Pretty oh. great. How was your convention? That's what's good. That's going to be my first question. Pictures. How was Terrificon? It, 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 Terrificon was, I, I'm told you have to say, it was terrific. <laughs> and it really was. Uh, Mitch Halleck, you know, I made the mistake of using another adjective to describe it, and he scolded me and said, it has to be terrific. It's on brand. And it was. It was great. Um, it was uh, pretty, pretty well attended, um, but everybody was, I think, you know, still trying to keep some sense of, uh, of distance and, you know, masked and conscious of, of health, which was good. Um, but it was, you know, as the first convention I'd done and, you know, as I calculated it over 20 years <laughs> as a guest anyway, um, you know, I've been to, been to other shows just to go, but to go as a guest, uh, it was nice to see that people were, uh, surprised I was alive and around and was actually at a convention <laughs> and I had a little monitor running with, uh, different podcasts, including yours, you know, highlight it with a QR code people could scan and, and listen in on stuff. Fancy. So fancy, exactly. And, uh, but it was, it was great just to see people surprise and talk about, uh, what they liked about the work. Um, and not so much about what they didn't like. Most of them seemed to like things. And, and I got some really good stories, you know, out of it. One guy came up and said, listen, I'm not going to say, um, that what I read, about Matt Murdock and Daredevil made me want to become a lawyer, but I'm a lawyer now. <laughs> so, so that was cool. And I was right across from Lee Weeks, uh, who of course, uh, you know, I worked with on the, my first run on Daredevil. So we, we threw um, stuff back and forth at each other uh, to, you know, uh, and handle the interest in Daredevil 300 and those sort of things. So it was, it was really a great, a great show. I, I need to pace myself differently because by the morning of Sunday, I could not walk because uh, people would come to the table and I would stand up and say hi. And, and then I'd stand while I was signing stuff. And I realized I'm out of practice. So <laughs> I thought your but it was terrific. I thought your hand was going to be worse than your legs just from. Signing no, no, stuff. The, no. The, hand, the hand was pretty good. A little little bit of a, a tension, but uh, no, the legs were. The concrete floor and cowboy Aww. boots and standing up and down adds up after a time. We'll have to get you one of those standing mats. Let us know the next yeah. time. Exactly. <laughs> a gel mat, you know, like take care of the take care of the guy. No, it was really, really fun. And um, I hope, you know, there might be more, you know, in the future. It'd be fun. And today I'm just going out after we finish here. And of course, it's free comic book day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, be checking that out. So are you willing to travel for cons then or? Yeah. I mean, this was not a big travel. This was yeah. probably two, two hours away from, from where I am. Um, but I, I think I'd be interested in, in a little bit of travel, all depending on, you know, what our overall world pandemic situation is and, and other things. But, uh, a lot of people kept coming up. Are you going to Baltimore? Are you going to Baltimore? It's like, I, do you, are you inviting me to Baltimore? Cause you don't just show up and say, hi, I'm here. It doesn't doesn't work that way, I don't think. 
come on, Steel City, come on, invite this man so I can buy him a lunch. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even wish Tampa Con right now because Florida's a mess. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Florida can get their act together, <laughs> we would have to refrain from having Tampa Con call you. <laughs> but, you know, it's clear people are, are eager to be together and, and share what they're, they're jazzed about. Uh, you know, their interest in comics or cosplay or, or whatever it was, there was a really palpable uh, sense that, that people were enjoying that. And this clearly from many, many people, this was like the first thing they'd gone to um, in a long, long, long time uh, for anything, let alone comics. It's good to see the smaller cons flourish, especially with the disappearance of Wizard Con and a couple of other, like, you know, institutions. So it's, it's good to see the yeah. cons flourish and pick that up. For the and this people. was, um, I can't remember what it was called when it was, uh, uh, I think I think it was the same show that was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, several years back before it transitioned to Terrific Con and moved up to this casino. So it clearly had grown in size and scale. And it was a very, I think, reasonably sized convention. It was not small but it definitely was not wall-to-wall crazy town either so good balance good to hear we definitely look forward to when the world gets back to normal to doing more of that (laughs) yeah absolutely heck yeah so let's get into it phil get into it all right so yes today we're talking about something a little different daredevil and batman eye for an eye Uh oh well good thing i have my copy as well so so i thought this one would be interesting uh just because wanted to ask you about some of the behind the scenes like what's involved in like i know there's a process for regular comics but it's like when you get two companies together is like is it like twice that do you have to talk to two editors do you have to run oh yeah oh yeah absolutely i mean um these things are a balancing act right because you're not only dealing with uh, uh one set of editorial mandates you are dealing with with two and then what are the comp how are the companies operating together um, are they really adversarial? Are the corporate overlords, you know, Warner Brothers and Disney at this point, you know, even willing to talk? How do the lawyers, you know, agree of what these two intellectual properties are doing together? I I don't know how many of these things happen nowadays, um, but they were, I think, a little bit more available and frequent earlier on because there was a lot of editors who had been and were friends. And then through different circumstances, they ended up at different, they ended up at different companies, right? Mike Carlin, who um, uh, was uh, Mark Grunwald's assistant at Marvel, would later go on to become, you know, the premier Superman editor at DC for various reasons, (laughs) you know, transitioned out of of Marvel, Uh, not for anything about him. But that opens the door then, I think, to those amalgam comics, right? You know, there's that whole amalgam line yeah. of things. And I think in a similar way here, we had uh, Denny O'Neill, who was the premier Batman editor, and Ralph Macchio. And I think Ralph was Denny's assistant at one point. Uh, but they were certainly friends and friendly. And so it became, while well, not just a given of saying, hey, let's do a book together, because the, there was lawyers and other things that probably had to happen behind the scenes, but it was a lot easier to check out and have Ralph say, could we do something like this? And Denny being much more considered saying, well, let's talk about it <laughs> and figure out what, what's the story, you know, cause that's going to be the first thing. Um, do we, do we do something like this? Not just because um, it might generate some sales. Certainly that's a big driver. That's why the publisher is going to decide to instigate something. But I think the friendship of those guys helped also smooth things and move things uh, no matter what but yeah they don't do any marvel dc crossovers anymore but uh which is a shame because these were always yeah i mean these these i mean i know when i was growing up through comics um and they they were rare but that when that would happen that was like oh my god the worlds (laughs) are coming together you know you're crossing over and these were a, a ball to do for the same reason because you're interested as a creator to say what would be like, what would it be like to play in that world, and vice versa. Um, so the editors are on board. Do they even get notes from higher up? I mean, again, you said a balancing act. Is it like, oh, you, well, you can't show Batman being more capable than Daredevil, and vice versa? Is it what was it very? 
No, I mean, not in this case. I mean, okay. again, this, this DC was owned by Warner's at that point, but, but in my tangential knowledge and experience, Warner sort of treated DC at that point as sort of, um, you know, a, a research lab for other properties. You know, they, they would sort of look at them and not really pay much attention uh, to what was going on. And Dis and Marvel was not owned by Disney at that point. They were owned by whatever other corporate entity was, but the, the notes were all just from Ralph and Denny and Denny was very, very, um, uh, precise about things. And I, I respected that. And in looking back at this, I wish I had had more direct dialogues with Denny, who I knew from when he was on staff at, at Marvel, mm -hmm. uh, to pick up on even more things, uh, like at one point, um, and there, this this went through a few drafts, you know, to, to get it to even where it is now, which is good. But there's certain things I would have done differently in retrospect. But I had a, a scene where um, Batman was driving the Batmobile, you know, through to get to New York or something, and Danny scolded me. <laughs> he, he, you know, he was like, "He's Batman's going to drive this on the open road, <laughs> you know, in, in this way. He's going to." go through the, the Lincoln Tunnel or, or whatever else that, you know, there was that sense of, okay, this is fantastic, but there's also a sense of reality, especially with these characters. So little things like that also add up to the way that you think about how the characters think and then how the characters are going to react. And there's that little bit of, I think there's, there's a line in there, even where Daredevil's like, you drove that from New York. Don't, don't be an idiot, you know? Well, you know, don't <laughs> don't make yourself look even more foolish. You know, of course, I have other ways of getting things, you know, around without being seen. So that generated even even little things like that generate your understanding of how a character operates. Oh yeah, it'd be great to get notes from Denny. I mean, he's he'd been in the business how many years, and he wrote oh, yeah. wrote, wrote both these characters at different points. So it's like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. Absolutely, and I, and I remember reading Denny's Batman and and being hugely influenced by it and his use of language and his use of storytelling. And I think he was one of the first writers I remember noticing that he was injecting other things that were clearly of interest to him into his stories. So he would put in, I remember the first time I think I ever came across the word mantra <laughs> was, was in a story that he had done uh, with Ra's al Ghul and, and Batman. And Batman was preparing himself for a battle and focusing his, his energies. And it's like, I'm thinking to myself, this is really cool. The use of that word didn't take me out of the story, but I was at a point where I was probably starting to think about there's a story behind this versus the story I'm just reading. And there's there's aspects this guy is bringing into it, and and that was, you know, different than say somebody who was just writing an amazing story about killer puppets, <laughs> you know, invading a city, and you know, Superman's got to blast them apart with heat vision or something. So um, he was intimidating, frankly. I, I will say that not 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 in his personality, but just from my own point of view of like. I mean, a lot of the guys I worked with were, wait a minute, I read your stories. But Denny, among many, for me at least, was like, oh, you're Denny O'Neill. But he was, you know, but there was no reason for that. He was very approachable and really nice, but he also wasn't going to take any nonsense when it came to characters he really understood. But yeah, comics have taught me a lot of vocabulary. You, you taught me yourself the pro bono. <laughs> See, there you go. Maybe you, you could have become a lawyer too. You know. <laughs> so uh, were the villain? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Were the villain choices like suggested, or did it just come to you and they go, "Oh, yeah, that makes sense." Um, it it made sense. I mean, as I started to kind of figure out what kind of story it would be, I think I settled on on Two Face very very quickly. He was probably there right from the beginning. Um simply because of the lawyer aspect. It was like, wait a minute, you've got a lawyer and a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Why why not do something with that? Which I, I think actually plays out really well. And in revisiting it, you know, for this, I, I think those aspects uh, play out nicely, but I think there's more I could have done with it. And I think there was, um, there was that sense that, I think it was a wrong sense now in retrospect that you had to pull in somebody else that you had to give equal treatment. Well, we've got a Batman villain. I guess we need a daredevil ish villain or a Marvelish villain, you know, as well. And Hyde That's made Mr. Hyde exactly Mr. like, yeah, the, the two for right. You know, it's, it's sort of like the, the two sides of the coin, um, maybe a little bit too on the nose, but he, 
he fit the mold for that. But I also think he complicated, even though he's the driver of parts of the story, you know, becomes the vessel for what Two Face is trying to do by using him as a as a as a instapot uh, <laughs> to kind of to kind of cook up this you know this technology. Um, you know, there, there's that tendency to start to add too many elements to it. We saw that in a lot of movies, certainly, especially Batman movies. Oh, we got one villain. Now we've got two. Now we've got five. Is there any room for, you know, Batman in this? I don't think it quite oh, breaks. Spider-Man tried to follow the ball. Oh, my God. Yeah. But we got a dancing scene on it, out of it, which we'll always have. We'll always have, uh, so, you know. But, uh, and I don't think it breaks the story, but. Again, it's easy to look back at things and then start to pick them apart based on who you are now. And I think that it could have been an even stronger story, maybe focusing on just, say, Two Face. And it, the, I mean, was it like a mandate that you had to use the characters as they were at that point? Because, you, again. It's still technically an Elseworlds tale, so. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like, you couldn't have used Jack Batlin, or did you have to use this version of Daredevil because, hey, maybe some Batman. Uh, fans would be picking this up who weren't reading Daredevil and be like, okay, this is what Daredevil is at this moment. so similar. If only Daredevil had money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, not, not quite. Not quite. Well, at this point... Um, Get to the pitch. I'm trying to think about... Uh, I'm trying to think about timing. Um, I don't... Um, was this... I guess this was Batman by this point. Um, well, I, think I don't think there was a mandate there wasn't a mandate of, of what to use or how to do it. But I think the, I, I think the way the, the characters were balanced out in this story um, made more sense for what the story was. Obviously, if he had been pretending to be Batlin, then you've got to bring that into the story. And there was enough packed in here that, um, that by uh, complicating it with one more la- layer would have probably been something that would have broken it, you know, more. The fact of the Elseworlds thing um, didn't really come into play. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in, well, this is this Elseworlds is an imaginary story or, or Alternative Worlds is an imaginary story or what if it are imaginary stories. They're all imaginary stories. <laughs> right? They're all, they're all, don't, sh- break the don't tell them. <laughs> um, I always love that, um, that opening. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that it was like the last two issues of, the original Superman in action comics that Alan Moore did. And, and, you know, he had to put that, that kind of coda in there, you know, of, of like, you know, this is an imaginary story, but of course they're all imaginary stories. So, you know, they obviously told them this isn't really happening because John Burns taking it over next, next issue. Um, okay. None of them happened. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, those are, those are things I think labels of convenience, the, the companies want to, want to put on them yeah. even even daredevil 380 was you know somewhat the same you know where they they want to put this label of well this is a story that might have been or happened earlier in his career or something like that <clears throat> so for me um i just stuck to the characters and just and worried about them putting the else worlds thing after the fact almost so you're just, yeah, I think like, again, I just thought maybe there'd be a whole bunch of more mandates on like a crossover because you are dealing with two different companies, but I guess you're saying there, there really wasn't. There wasn't. I mean, if there had been, it would have been much more problematic. Um, and I think this is, um, if comics have become more complicated, they've done themselves a disservice, these types of comics, you know, at a you know big owned by, you know, big companies, they've probably done themselves a disservice by, by adding those additional layers of what you can or can't do because um and you would run into mandates at different editorial levels for different projects when there was the big company-wide crossovers or a big event or something um you had to get your character into a certain place at a certain time or you had to acknowledge that something was happening if they weren't directly involved or you really wanted to use a character and my story was going to hinge on spider-man appearing in in this issue but the spider office could say, nope, too many Spider-Man appearances this month. It's oversaturated. You know, good luck figuring out what you're going to do. It's not my problem. Um, Other comics could never have that. Problem. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, comics is for as, as much as it's a, a big team, right? Essentially, you've got a pretty small team on a book, right? You got an editor, an assistant editor, writer, penciler, inker, colors, letterer. 
that's your primary, you know, group of folks. And to some degree, the ones driving it are mostly the editor, assistant editor, writer, and, and, and artist. So as long as you're making sane choices and nobody's going to probably at that point affect you. And then when you have that friendship of Denny and Ralph and that professional respect as well, and that connection, it cut through a lot of stuff. At some point, somebody had to sign off, you know, and, and say, yes, we will do this book, but they're doing it more from, okay, Daredevil sells this and has this popularity. Batman sells this and has this popularity. Sure. Put them together and, and you'll have a fudge Sunday. You, you know, it's, it's, it's even better for us from a bottom line, as long as, as long as you're going to deliver on something like that, that's what we care about. Um, and, and now again, there might be a lot more people who think they own the characters, but, um, I wish there was more drama to it in that respect, but it was actually nicer for, you know, the, the one drama to it, which I never really understood. And, and it kind of, uh, rattled my cage a, a little bit was they slow walked this project forever. Hmm. And, you know, for, and, and, you know, it was, it, it kept getting pushed back. And, and in fact, it, that's one of the reasons it lost the original artist because Lee Weeks was supposed to be the original artist on this. So there's your little bit of, well, wow, people yeah, know so that. How, how did Scott McDaniel, yeah. So Lee was supposed to be the, the artist on this and, and was excited about doing it and, and, um, and probably would have gone in a much different way altogether if Lee had been on it. Uh, but a combination of it kept getting pushed back and it, and they were not giving him a firm commitment to the, the rates that he wanted. I'm remembering this like oh, yeah. 22%. So if Lee comes back and says, Dan got it all wrong, let's go with Lee's version. But he's more than welcome <laughs> to come and set the record straight. But, but, and, and it, and it just, the, the lack of commitment, you know, for him was a very important thing. You know, he wanted to know you're going to, we're going to do this book. We're going to do this book on the schedule. We're going to do this book at the rate that I promised. And when it didn't happen, um, by a certain point, he said, I'm, I'm out. I can't, I can't keep hoping and wondering and putting my plans against this. And, and in fact, it led me to ask for, I need some assurance, Ralph, too. Are we going to do this book? Um, and, uh, and I got a very half baked letter from, uh, <laughs> you know, from Bob Harris, you know, finally when I asked, um, and it, it, I have it somewhere and it, it's like a one line letter. And it's kind of like, uh, yes, we will be doing this book and you will be the writer so long as you maintain the standards of editorial, um, you know, uh, professionalism that Marvel expects. It was something like that. And to me, it was like this eye rolling moment of like, I've done dozens, hundreds of comics. I've been on staff. You all know me. <laughs> you wrote Daredevil for how many years before this? <laughs> yeah. And so like the fact that I had to, you know, have it written out that I would maintain the levels of, of professionalism was, man, you're really looking to like kind of get under people's skin here a little bit. <laughs> But I put it in a drawer and, and moved on. But, um, you know, while it was disappointing to, to lose Lee, uh, obviously, um, uh, Scott was not an also ran. You know, Scott was a, obviously a great partner and, and had great associations with the character and the characters because by that point he had, you know, moved on to uh, Nightwing and, and, and such. So he had experience in Gotham. And, uh, and it felt like, okay, this will this will be a great opportunity. Let's see if we can enlist him into it. And thankfully he, he accepted and we were able to get rolling with that. Yeah. They must've been impressed because a few years after this, he got the Batman book. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's a lot of logic, you know, to that for the work he was doing and doing the work with Chuck Dixon. And, and so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, uh, synergies, you know, with that. So you said there were a few things you would change in hindsight. What else, what else, uh, you know, you because I thought it was it, a pretty good issue. It is. It's a pretty good issue. And I think it's got the opportunity to be a really great issue, you know, or story in there. And, and I, and I, I think I, I said at one point in my newsletter, uh, you know, it's one of the only plots I had that was outright rejected. You know, the first version of this Ralph just called and said, yeah, it's not going to work. 
And, <laughs> and I don't even remember what, what that was. I mean, it was, it was not this. It wasn't like, oh, I just changed the scene or two. It was a complete rewrite. Oh, okay. um, and, um, and I think it was just, it was whatever, I don't know, wherever my head was at, whatever was kind of going on, it was, it was off the mark. Maybe it was the sense of, wow, bringing these guys together. Um, maybe it was too intimidating or, um, I was off my game, but that level set me and, and made me rethink that, um, of how, how am I going to approach this? I, I think the, um, the, did we lose Lilith? No, I think you know, she probably. Oh, just on mute. Something, yeah. Um, you know, it, it has that opening that, that spends, um, too much time sort of, I think, setting things up, um, and has these guys come together separately, which is necessary mm -hmm. to a degree. But I would have brought, like, say, Two Face into that scene instead of instead of a, a mention. I would have brought him in earlier, right? They don't show up until about you know a third of the way through or so. I think that would have made more sense, and then started kind of like turn the wheels with um, Murdoch and Dent a little bit more. Um, it would have changed the dynamic of the scenes up front with Daredevil and Batman some where it wasn't just confronting each other, mini fight, you know, which is kind of a trope. And the classic setup. The classic <laughs> setup, which, you know, hey, it works. No, I think it I think it's a reasonable form of it here, but I, I think I could have done in hindsight's great. You know, you can look back at something and say, Oh, I should have done that. I, I think that would have been better. I think um I was obviously still in my obsessed with technology mode uh, aspect, you know, as maybe my leftover notes from Tree of Knowledge or, or something like that, um, influencing aspects of the, the cyberpunk elements of the story. Uh, and uh, while I think that's kind of interesting, I was obviously fascinated with this whole body horror, body transformation thing of what's going on, watching too many David Cronenberg movies. Um, but no, it, uh, such thing, no such thing as too many David Cronenberg movies. Exactly. Uh, but, it, you know, I could have streamlined that, that MacGuffin a, a little bit, Phil, I think, you know, as well. I, it, it take, it, it pays off in the end. I think, you know, like all the pieces come together and it kind of connects, but the upfront part where it's like, why are they stealing this and what's going on here? And, you know, it takes a little bit of time. And, um, and I really like the, the, the incidents and the dialogue of the, um, of the, um, you know, the scenes where, um, where Murdoch and, and, uh, Dent are, are in law school, but I'm not sure. And I no longer have the plot, so I don't know. Um, but I think it would have been more effective if the dialogue was, you know, on the characters in the scenes mm -hmm. than as these separate sort of written pieces. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, cause I think the, the dialogue works and I think the moments work, but there's a difference. I think when you interpret comics and you read comics, when somebody's saying it versus it being in these separate panels, sometimes this device works, right? Where you've got images and then you've got prose and dialogue written alongside this. I did this in Daredevil 380 in some of the courtroom scenes. And I think that works really well, but rereading this, I think it actually sort of takes you out of the story a little bit what I'm trying to get you into feeling that these guys had a relationship that will pay off later. Is that like so, an, a writer's trick where it's like, yeah, this isn't going to fit in a word bubble. So, you know, you know, I don't want, I'm not going to completely obscure Scott's art. So you do it that way. I don't know. I really don't know. I'd have to go back and read the plot and know why I did it this way. Hmm. You, you know, I, I, and I don't know. Did I, did I suggest to Scott, Hey, let's do it this way and I'll write the prose out of it. Or did he sort of illustrate it this way? And I mean, he must have been leaving room for for copy because you know for the for the writing because there's no way he would have left a gutter yeah. this big. So we must have talked unless he was ah oh, you know rulers I'm out of here. Um, but <laughs> and you know you can also reposition elements on a page sometimes. Yeah. You know, from an editorial point of view, you can cut panels and move them a little bit, give them a little bit more breathing room. Um, but I must have maybe suggested, hey, because this is a flashback, maybe we handle it this way. And he bought into it. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, I think this, I think this, I think the prose in this section pulls you out of it, right? It, to me, it does now, anyway, a little bit. It's good. It's good motivation. 
and connection, but I think it could have been handled uh, a little bit more uh, in that way. So, um, you know, it's, it's easy to pick the stuff apart, um, but there's things that work. I think the whole Harvey Dent, you know, Matt Murdock thing is, is, is keen. I think the turn at, at the end where Dent, you know, sort of struggles with that reminder from Daredevil works really well. Oh, yeah. uh, um, uh, I think um, Dent's insults to Batman are, are good. You know, Gotham irritatingness, you know, Gothamitis irritatingness, you know, where he <laughs> look, identifies the rodents in the room. Um, you know, <laughs> there's, um, you, you, you know, but... Um, uh, these are kind of the things you discover y- y- along the way. Um, probably could have used a third or fourth draft uh, to get to really the right place, but that's beyond the fact at this point. No, like I said, I enjoy. I really enjoyed the story. Um, I'm sure it was probably it probably was a mandate the the page count because I was like, man, I could have used more of this. Oh yeah, the page count was just what it was. That that's tough, right? Yeah, but you well. need to. But but that's when you need to. Yeah. You need to think about um, what kind of story you're trying to tell. 48 pages is, what is this? That, this 48? I think it's 48. Um, you know, that's t- over twice the length of what a typical comic was at that point. So that's that's good breathing room. But, man, you could fill up 48 pages easy. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're doing a, you know, Batman and Daredevil. It's like, how often does this happen? You probably want to stretch your legs, you know? Yeah. But that's also why, again, it's hindsight. But yeah. going back, uncomplicating the problem in, in in saying I've only got 48 pages. I've only got 48 pages, big air quotes for those just listening. Um, that's still something you can fill up really quickly. So uncomplicate your situation so you can let them breathe more. And again, I'm a more hopefully mature and better writer than I was then. So it's easy for me to pick on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and say, what the hell were you thinking? Why were you doing that? But I probably would have said now, just two face alone, right? Again, mm-hmm. could have could have been a good somebody to play off the two sides of Daredevil and Batman more, right? Even though Lilith, like you were saying before, oh, it's just Daredevil without money. I mean, sorry, it's Batman without money. And certainly at one point Murdoch had money, right? He had a penthouse, he was a lot more in that that let's just keep recreating the millionaire um, playboy vigilante type mold. But, but that would have been probably an interesting thing. Maybe the, maybe the whole story was more from, from two faces point of view and two face playing off the light ish, darkish sides of the characters in the coin with some kind of, you know, um, MacGuffin or rationalization. I don't even know what it would be, but now I'm thinking about that. And just as we're talking and saying, wow, that would have been an interesting story. And maybe the whole thing's from Two Faces' point of view, for that fact. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and could have been an interesting thing. Maybe I'll call, you know, Tom Brevoort and say, and I'll pitch that to him and, him I and Carlin. I enjoy the contrast of, you know, Maddie, <laughs> Maddie's whole final justice versus, you know, oh, good old Harvey Dent's rehabilitation. Yeah. I did enjoy that. Yeah, I so mean, oh, that, how the how the tides have turned. how the tides have turned, but but that was you know, but that's also little bits of the characters, right? You know, it's it's you know, Dent was willing to play you know with the rules, you know, a little bit, and, and Murdoch was always they're either on the mat or they're off the mat. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about typhoid Mary, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, he's a, he's a complicated character. Let's you know. <laughs> But I, I know you've written a little Batman, but did you enjoy writing Batman? Um, do you have like a bat, some Batman stuff uh, in your head? Like you could maybe write some more because I mean, they, they, I guess they put out DC's November solicits uh, a day or two ago. And they said like half the line coming out in November is either going to be Batman or Batman centric or Batman's going to show up in a bulk, like, like at least 50% of the line is going to be some Batman something. And is that news? Water makes things wet. Exactly. <laughs> and is that does that contribute to? And maybe I'll see that when I go to the, the comic store later. Um, do they think that contributes to? Uh, it's the only thing they've got to, to to hook people with, or does it create like oversaturation? I guess they way think, too much. I guess they think Batman sells because yeah. Well, Batman does sell, but I think there's also that that oh, matter okay. of of oversaturation. You, you know, I, yeah. I certainly know that. Danny Fingeroth, who was the Spider-Man editor, um, uh, you know, was 
always very conscious of that. And like I was saying before, like, I want to use Spider-Man or I want to use Ghost Rider, you know, some, I want to use Ghost Rider. I want to use the Punisher and these popular characters. Oh, the 90s. Yeah, but, but, to, but there were, you know, smart editors would, would put a, would hold the line on certain things. No, nope, Punisher's already in, in six stories this, this month or 12 stories or 24 stories, whatever. But there were, there was a line at some point that you would draw well, because otherwise it just waters everything down. Um, well, I think like Lilith hinted at, it's like, I think these days it's like, oh, can you squeeze a little more Batman into this book? Or, hey, can you use Spider-Man over here somewhere? Or... Yeah. And, and again, it makes sense from a sales point of view. These are popular things. You're trying to sell the books. Um, and then we have know. so much synergy now in this modern era as well, where everything, they're trying to line this up with this release Hey, there's date, a movie this out. Pop yeah. release and- right, right. But if you're, it's also, what are you trying to do with the characters? If you're trying to maintain a certain personality for Spider-Man or Batman or anybody is, are, are you, is that happening in every single one of those books or is one, you know, a, a lazy writer or artist or something like that deciding, yeah, you know, web flu, it's a little slow today. I'm just going to have Spider-Man pull an Uzi out, you, you know, <laughs> and, you know <laughs> or Daredevil's going to rip the car door off because that's a lot easier, you know, because then, trying to figure out I was going to get the guy out of the car. Um, but to your question, uh, Phil, I, I think um, I was clearly walking a careful line, I think, here, distinguishing Batman from Daredevil. Yeah. The way that they spoke, the choices they made, the way that they approached the scene, the crime scene, the situations. And to me, I, I, who the heck knows where my mind was then, but looking at it now... Um, I I think it would have been a lot more fun to play with him in that way. And and the aspects of him that I was clearly laying into, certainly to try to find synergies with Daredevil, was around that observation and the sensory aspect and the detective aspect of it, which I always, again, getting back to my roots, dug from Batman is the world's greatest detective, yeah. right? That was, that was, you know, the, the, the subhead line, or, you know, on on certain comics or whatever. Um, and sometimes that comes out, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes he's just the dark knight. He's the grim force, the Avenger of the night, you know, and, and um, that was my bad Christian Bale. And <laughs> that would be more, that would be more like this. Uh, and, and that aspect gets lost. Oh yeah. But I, I, I was obviously zeroing in on that here. And I think that would have been, a lot of fun to play out. Do you guys play video games at all? Oh, yeah. Did you ever play, it's you know, the, the original um, Arkham games, the Batman Arkham games? Yes. You know, yes. I mean, those, aside from the fact of just being, wow, I'm in Gotham City and I get to go anywhere. I love those because they did have that detective aspect. I mean, yeah. certainly he slugged plenty of people and things, but there was those great scenes of you're breaking down the scene. Right, you're 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 having to figure things out as the the world's greatest detective. Um, and if I had a chance at at Batman um, uh, more then or now, you know, for that matter, I think I'd love to lean into that and play up the detective aspect um, as much as the you know the grim shadow of the night. What was that book, uh, Batman's Grave, that you liked so much, Bill? That you said brought that. Yeah, like yeah, year? a lot of that. He was. Uh going through a couple different crime scenes. <clears throat> yeah, and they really played up it, like Batman as a detective. Yeah, because that's, really? yeah, that's what me and Lil thought. Yeah, what was it, like a year or so ago? Yeah. Uh-huh. It, was, it was like cool. two years at this point. Yeah. Oh, maybe, yeah. Or, you know, 2020, just big 2020 black is still, hole still time. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it was it's like, called Batman's Grave? Uh, I think it was The Batman's Grave. But yeah, it was like 12 issues, and it was him wow. uh, investigating a couple different crime scenes, and it all culminated in like a big like conspiracy thing at the end. But yeah, I mean, it was it was good. Me and Lilith are always saying that's like our favorite Batman stories, comics, movies. It's like, yeah, the action's nice, but when you can like mix in the detective work and stuff, it's... Well, that's what yeah, starts that's to Gotham. distinguish it. Go ahead, Lilith. I think Sorry. they did a great job with Gotham and the like juxtaposition of New York, even though, you know, that whole thing... <laughs> <laughs> like, well, technically. and that's what's i think those that's the interesting dynamic to the character um again at least for me or and you, you have to find those hooks with any character otherwise they they quickly become just the same 
right? And you never want things to be the same. And we got a lot of grim Avengers in comics. And even though Batman's the, the template for that, Batman, it doesn't need, the, the circle doesn't need to go completely around and then just kind of get back to him and, and make, well, let's make him even more grim, right? Yeah, he's grim. He had a bad day. He went insane. You know, he's not a balanced character. All right, we got all these things. But if that's all he is, then, it, you know, it's just, it's anybody, right? It's, it's, and, and that detective aspect, that training, that precision, um, then again, I, I just go back to, to the first impressions I had of him, uh, in a really strong way were those Danny O'Neill stories that I, I read. And I just, the, the Raz Agul stories, the ones that really jump out to me and, and, and that precision of that character and the way he trained and the way he moved and the way he thought, and the way he analyzed his opponent was not just, I'm a better fighter than you. I'm bigger than you. I've got a longer cape and pointier ears than you. I, I have, I have things going on. I have these skills and I know how to use them for Liam Neeson, right? <laughs> Certain skills. So, yeah, well, I mean, again, would you be interested in writing a Batman? I'd love to see like you on like a monthly Batman book. And again, that seems like that's what they're really trying to pump out there. Again, it's either <laughs> Batman books or like, you know, they have related stuff, you know, Nightwing, uh, Harley. Right. Quinn, the Bat that family, the Bat umbrella. <laughs> right, right. I think it's like showing up at the Baltimore con, you know, I just, I'll just show up at DC and just say, Hey, I'm writing a title and just, you know, see how that goes. Or I'll just, you know, write it, write it and send it in and, and then see somebody will just say, Oh, this must be something. We'll publish it. You, you know, who would turn something like that down? Right. You know, even, even in terms of doing something like this or, or, um, you're never, you're never going to turn away an opportunity like that. Maybe you would actually, who knows? You know, if somebody came to you and said, it's got to, be this and it's got to play into all these pieces of continuity and you've got to play up all this other aspects, this other team left over, or you've got to incorporate all those things that suddenly becomes so complicated. What chance do you have to do anything? Right. And, and that might be in place where, yeah, wow, great. I have my name on a Batman book, but I'll spend so much time doing other things. What's the point of it? So is that is that the comics business? At least now it's like you can't like send them a script even, you know, with your body of work. Do they have to come to you and be like, hey, would you like to write a Batman book for us? Do you have to wait for them? Um, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, that's not something I've I've played in in long enough time to, to sort of say. I, I think that um I think people can break in any number of different ways. Okay. I think it's probably trickier, just just like there was when I was you know, working full time in, in the business, there would be people who, who would um, have a reputation and, and editors would go after them because they wanted that value of somebody, right? I, I want, you know, Jim Lee on my book, you know, I want Neil Gaiman on my book or, or something. And you try to get them because that's going to boost your profile. Um, but there'd be other people who would diligently try to kind of break in and they would they would send in plots and scripts and and artwork and some followed the rules right and by the rules i mean generally when i would meet people i would say hey listen send me a proposal make it short get to the point this way i can evaluate and then we can talk and then i'd get people who would send in 300 page scripts and say man man when you read this you're you're gonna hire me right away so, yeah when i read that um, <laughs> um, and then sometimes you'd meet people, mostly artists, I would say at, at conventions and, and you would see something and you would immediately know that's, that person's got chops and, and you'd be able to bring them, you know, in right away and, and get a start on some things. Um, I imagine there's probably still components of that across the way. Um, but. Uh, I have still probably a handful at this point, you know, of, of contacts that I, I could probably talk to. Um, but by and large, you know, it's kind of a cold call at this, at this stage where I could use my reputation as a door opener. But, um, but a lot of folks would be like, you know, what do you, what, what do you have to bring us that whatever, you, you know, na name somebody, you know, that, 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 well, the 90s are back in effect, that 90s nostalgia. Just yeah, like, and, you know, and I think, well, no listen, we're, we're talking, you know, why, you know, I'm doing other podcast interviews, you know, I get invited to a convention. There's a, there is a nostalgia for certain things like that. 
um, or people who have, who who read those when they were younger are now in positions where they're like, hey, we want to talk about this some more, um, which is terrific. I'm enjoying that. But I, whether that opens a door or something, I don't know. And I, I'm not angling for that. The only thing I'm angling for that with is uh, possibly is one story with Mark Nelson that I was talking to somebody at Terrificon with. Uh, Mark Nelson was the artist who probably most famously did Aliens, but a lot of other things. And, uh, and we had actually developed an entire what if story, which was this whole thing called Hexpionage, which was this, uh, um, what if Dr. Strange ran shield oh. and, and, and Nick Fury was sort of, you know, on the outs with him, but he had to recruit Fury for a special mission, you know, some, of some form. And, uh, and we had actually pitched it. We sold it. I wrote it. Mark illustrated half of it, um, which is crazy cool looking. And then the whole comics market crashed. They fired the editors. <laughs> the book vanished into into just some else worlds, you know. And and uh, uh, but Mark still has the artwork, as far as I know. And uh, it's one of the few plots I have left, you know. So I keep toying with the idea of calling Tom Brevoort and saying, "Listen, we've got a half finished story that you paid for somewhat back in the day. You know, what if we took?" what you can see from here and finish it, finish it off. It would be different now than it was then, but that would be kind of a cool thing. So I don't know if you'd be interested in going back, but I mean, I don't know. Is Chip Zdarsky leaving Daredevil soon? Cause isn't he one of the ones going the sub stack? Um, I think Chip is, I don't know Chip and I'm throwing his name out like I do. Yeah. Chip, you know, um, I believe so. I think I just read that in, um, in probably a sub stack newsletter, but, um, but he's leaving uh, uh, Daredevil and then, um, yeah, that, that Substack thing is going to be an interesting, uh, experiment to see where, how they, how they tell stories, you know, in that and, and how people respond to it. Is that like the new image of the, like the modern time? I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I mean, that's where my newsletter is. It's, it's on Substack. Oh, yeah. Buzz. yeah. I'm totally interested. Me too. I, I think it's, I think it's, um, Something has to happen to shake up the industry. I was going to say, it must be something very um, attractive about it. I mean, like, the, the, you know, James Tynan, Clint who's writing the main equity. Batman book, and Nick Snyder, who's writing Amazing Spider-Man, are both leaving to go there. I'm like, there must well, be... Well, I'm, sure I'm sure they're offering them a boatload of cash, which oh, yeah. they should be, because that'll, that'll cover the their, their part of it, and, and I assume that also covers... The creation of the com- of the the rest of the comic as well, right? It's not just the money to them, you know, but the that, that's got to cover who's the artist, you know, who's the the finish, um, and so so that's an advance in essence, and then um, and if you maintain control of it, right? Substack's taking a piece of it if for the paid whatever, what is it, ten ten or fifteen percent or whatever it is, um, but as I understand it they maintain the ownership of the properties so they can go do what they want with it afterwards. And the creative um, freedom, they can do whatever they want with their book. And the creative freedom, because, and, but it's on them to be something that, now they have a base, they have an audience, the audience will follow them. Um, uh, you, you know, um, James, again, first name basis for people I don't know, but, uh, but I, I think I read in his newsletter, he expected to maybe hit his goal uh, of subscribers by the end of the first week. And he said the, he hit the goal in the first three hours, right? So whatever he was looking to raise as paid subscribers, you know, he hit fairly quickly. And so I, I think that's, you know, that's the, um, certainly a big appeal, right? For, for a creator, uh, to have that freedom. I think the one thing you've got to watch for there is, is, Who's your who's your editorial point of view? Who's your editorial eye on these things? I'm assuming he had a good editor on Batman, right? Or and let's assume my friend Chip, <laughs> um, you know, had a good editor on Daredevil, right? Um, I I know I benefited from having good editors, and when I didn't have good editors, or I was left to my own devices, even with my own sensibilities you can go off the reservation pretty quick. So you want to make sure that, you know, hopefully that's part of the package too and how they're thinking about it. But I think that's going to be, um, 
a real great place to hopefully see some some good additional comics that would have been harder to then say, well, we can't do these in print because we have, we've we've run out of our our budget, you know, for the year. My whole point was uh, just I I would love to open like the you know the previews or whatever, and you know after Chip leaves, just see you know. T.G. Chichester's back on Daredevil after how many years? <laughs> that would be that would be interesting. That would be cool. I don't know if I'd want to write the the, the regular book though. Oh really? I, I, don't, I don't. I don't know that. Um, I'm a lot more interested with characters like Daredevil or or Batman. But you know, let's say Daredevil. Just be, thinking back to those those series that we were gonna do. Mm-hmm. You know that I think I've mentioned before. Uh, you know, there were these contained stories where you're going to be able to, to, to explore things with the character in the world and then kind of bring them to a finish as opposed to the continuity aspect of comics where you keep going on and on and on and on. And then it, 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 it can run out of, out of, out of steam or fuel or how do you keep all the pieces, you know, moving? There's a, there's a nicety to sort of being able to complete a story and, and walk away from it and then come back to the world you know, in another way. Yeah. Lil, so. I think, Lil, did you have some kind of what if pitch for Daredevil for him? Did I? Wasn't it, the, wasn't it what we were kind of talking about before? It's like, you know, what if Matt Murdock had grown up in money like Bruce Wayne? You know, how would that have changed his moral <laughs> character and everything? And Yeah, he wouldn't be the same, but it, it's interesting. We got a glimpse of it, but just to see that full on old money Matt Murdock. <laughs> Did you ever see the uh, not to not to pat myself on the back? Did you ever see the what if issue I did, Lilith? No, the, I think the, I have. Yep, the seventy three. Yep. So it's what it, it was originally called. What if the kingpin had adopted Daredevil, and then they changed it to what if the kingpin owned Daredevil, which was a weird turn of phrase. Um, but uh, but it was sort of the proposition was when um, uh, when Jack Murdoch was killed. For whatever, I can't remember the exact reason off the top of my head now. Um, the kingpin was there, or you know, in proximity, and saw this kid, you know, crying and alone, and took him under his wing. So Murdoch was raised essentially by the kingpin in that money, in that surroundings, with all the abilities he had, and sort of became the kingpin's right hand man <laughs> in a way, and so was raised in a somewhat money and certainly morally compromised situation. <laughs> I will have to definitely go check that one out. I like, like that story. Big what if girl, to be honest. No, I don't no. I actually even like a lot of Elsewhere tales, although some of those are the best DC stories. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's the, the joke we had was always uh, all what if stories either end pretty much back exactly where they started. Like think the thing that was going to happen always happens anyway. The Fantastic Four, ends up being formed or uh or or the universe explodes those those are the only two options that happen you know because of this consequence of effects the butterfly effect takes effect and the entire universe explodes because of that one you know thing <laughs> because cap shield had you know four stripes instead of you know five instead of three the entire universe explodes yeah. so and, uh, <laughs> either, yeah. someone, either someone else puts on the suit or there's a big body count. <laughs> that's what it's, it's, exactly like, yeah, kind of like, yes, we still have a cap and uh, that's what I'm kind of interested to see where they go with the rest of these. What if uh, but, animations? I, oh yeah. To get back to the story though, I do like that you remember that um, Harvey did, did have humanity. I think a lot of people forget that about Two Face. They just want to do Two Face and not Harvey Dent. But that, and, yeah, and, it, and it's and that's that's that was critical to me. I mean, that's I think in all in all self analysis, that's why I'll stand behind the story for all the things I picked at it and said, oh, I should have done this or should have done that. I'll that's the the spine of the story which should have been stronger throughout was Harvey Dent's a lawyer, Matt Murdock's a lawyer, like the law matters to them in different ways, but equally important. And the aspect of Dent and that relationship they had when they were so young, even though it's make believe um, is, is, is critical to who is critical to the story. And it's also critical to who he is. Otherwise there is no, it's not two face. It's just ugly face. Right. You know, there, and, and, and that, if I ever wrote that character again and, and had a chance to play it out, that would be a point of discussion with an editor of like, what can we do there? 
because if you're not playing both sides of the coin, it's just a bad guy, a bad, bad, bad guy who occasionally, you're right, who occasionally flips the coin, it comes up clean and he walks away from the situation instead of executing everybody. And is that that interesting? Just like, again, is Batman that interesting if all he is is the Grim Avenger? Um, I, I don't think so, because what do you got to work with? You, you play the note once, and then you just keep plinking at that make-believe piano behind you, you know, again and again and again, of just hitting the same, you know, the same note. Um, and as a writer, um, or you look for those moments you draw out, and that's what I look for here. I mean, that's what's to going back and saying, okay, what do I know about these guys and how do I start to draw out the little bits and pieces of who they can be and what they can do? I mean, there seems to be a big interest in Harvey Dent lately. I mean, they did like a two part animated adaptation of Batman, the long Halloween. That's right. Mm. That's right. How was that? It was good. I, I, I mean, I'm, well, if I, I don't know. So you, long I mean, I mean, some part good. two is almost 90 minutes. I mean, I enjoyed that. I think sometimes their animated stuff's too short, but I mean, it was, some, I thought it was one of their best uh, animated things in a long time. Okay, I'll have to check that out. I'll have to you know, dig into that. But yeah, part one so- and part two, it's over two hours so, all together. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay, not bad. I, I, I just wanted to commend you. I don't know how hard it was for you, but if I was a writer writing Batman and Daredevil, it would take so much restraint not to just be like, and they fight for eight pages. Like- <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I have them fight for at least four pages, hey, which is, again, is probably paycheck. four pages too long. But No, no, not at all. Like That's <laughs> kind of like the... the the whole thing that like kind of drew me in about the story is like, ooh, Daredevil and Batman, yeah, let's see these fighting styles. So yeah, this man <laughs> earns his paycheck. Come on, Lil. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if I could have gotten them to do like two two forty eight page issues, then I could have done the first one just all fight, and then the second one, you know, work it work it through there more. That would have been all yeah, Scott McDaniel. The story is great. I, you, you're a writer, and you have your hindsight, and you're going to nitpick. But I'm just going to tell you, it's a really good, solid story. And Thank you, Lilith. Really that's that's I I will I will take that. And I will agree with that. And nitpicking is e- nitpicking is easy, right? Then that's the editor of me coming out and saying, "Yeah, go back and change it." You know, wait, I can't. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I know definitely. If you're a Daredevil or Batman fan or both, yeah, definitely. Re- if you can pick this up, pick it up because I don't know. He found that balance. Like sometimes when you read the story, like what was that? Uh, what was that last crossover that we did? It's just like. I think he can. I think the other guy came out on top. <laughs> now, didn't they do? Didn't they do? And I haven't read them. Didn't they do like two or three others of two or three other Batman Daredevil? They did. Like, a, I know up? they did at least one more two. a few years after yeah. this. I know. Yeah, yeah. And how does that? I'm not looking for praise or destruction. How did that? How do those stories play out? What did they do? I mean, it was all right. I think what was the one? The other one we did was uh, Alan it was basically Grant. Was a it? Magu- yeah, one was just basically a MacGuffin, <laughs> like for three fourths of the story, and then they finally show. Up oh, well, we we did two uh, two Batman uh, Spider Man ones too, which uh, both you know DC one and Marvel one both were written by J.M.D. Mateus. <laughs> oh well, that's. He's good. And he's he's <laughs> really good. Say the least. He was really good because they both seem like really different like styles, and it's like, man, this. I, if I didn't know, I wouldn't even, almost wouldn't know the same man wrote both of these. Well, did they come out back to back, or did they come no, out like, like a year, break there was, in between? There's years a, apart. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes that's a fun device too. If you're doing those sort of things, and say you do two issues, yeah. and then you do one. But they were meant from, to come out closer together. Oh, that so maybe maybe, maybe he they, did. They, them they, at the maybe same they time. did the same thing to him. They did to you. It's like maybe they like kept it. You know, a lot of those elseworld uh, elseworld tales are like that though. They get delayed. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm thinking like he could have. You know, one. Sometimes you do one from like the DC perspective and then yeah. one from the Marvel perspective. Oh, and it was and then, definitely that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's like because Batman or Batman's got to win in this one. Spider Man's got to win in that one, and then everything equalizes, and we go home happy. Yeah, because I think as my Facebook. Oh no, as my tweet says. Batman really wanted Spider-Man to put on a Robin suit. <laughs> I love that. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, because the, the first one was in 95, like right in the middle of the Clone Saga, and it was like Joker and Carnage, and then what was the other? The second oh, one was what, like five years later or something, and it was Kingpin and Ra's al Ghul. But the, the, again, it's the same thing. They're both so, you know, it's it's that sense of that sense of um, everything's got to be equal, right? Yeah. But But by God, Ra's al Ghul, Kingpin, Joker, uh, you know, Carnage, even who I'm, you know, even not a fan of Carnage, but still 
any one of those four is enormous enough to carry the story on his own. Yeah. Right. It, it uh, you start to put them together and all you're doing is looking for, you know, uh, excuse me, pissing contests, you know, between these, these gigantic characters and it overburdens the story. And, and I think if I ever had a chance to do it again, I would, let's pick the best villain, the best antagonist and figure a way for her or him to work for this story, as opposed to like keeping adding Catwoman and Penguin and, you know, and Mr. Freeze and, you know, and just, you get to, you get to Batman forever or something like that in no time at all. Do you think they would let you get around that just by creating a brand new character that neither one has ever encountered and that way you could get do the one villain thing? You might, but I think you also, um, right. Part, part of the, part of the intellectual and also uh, profiteering reason you're doing these oh, things yeah. is, is to play off the worlds. Right. So, um, well, you might, uh, so I think you want to, you, you want to play with that continuity, right? You want to play with that world and to some extent or another and draw something new out of it. Like the, Dent is a lawyer. Let's remember that and let's play that up aspect with the other guy who's a lawyer. Um, you know, that would have been a cool story on its own. Uh, Daredevil and Two Face. <laughs> and Foggy in the background. I never and used that guy anyway. <laughs> um, but I, I think, um, you know, I think that, Phil, that would be, uh, you know, interesting. But I think, um, you know, you, you, you look for. Yeah. Uh, you know, playing off other things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I couldn't have just done a Batman Daredevil story and then and focused on them more, right? There could have been just like what's their whole shtick uh, and what's their whole moments together it doesn't necessarily need to hinge on a Two Face or a Mister Hyde or Stilt Man, <laughs> but who knows. But yeah, that's a, that's the, the only thing I don't like. I love these stories, but it's like until these guys can Marvel and DC can make a deal again, we're never going to see that Matt Murdock uh, Harvey Dent connection again. Yeah, and that yeah, and that's 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 the that's the uh, downside of these things, and then them labeling these Elseworlds, mm -hmm. you know, aspect. But you can't you you know by rights you also can't play with that, right? You can't suddenly have in regular Daredevil continuity. Uh, okay. Harvey. chip yeah. you know mentioning you know harvey dent you know or something like that because it's like well, wait a minute that's these got to be seismic events even if that seismic event is just denny and ralph you know making something happen Harry bent instead. exactly <laughs> or you get something weird there's a typo in this book too that was really weird hmm. it's a i don't know if you noticed that like there's there's the last page which is of course the worst place for it <laughs> there's um the first the first line of dialogue from from Bruce Wayne. And, uh, you know, he says, if you're here looking for new clients, let me say that Gotham city can be a dangerous place. And then they, somebody took the last, uh, caption of the book, which was end with a question mark. And for some reason, it's just, it's there at the end of the balloon. And, uh, <laughs> and it's just like, it's just a weird thing that sort of throws the whole pacing off. Anyway, again, nitpicking. Ah, uh, perfectionist. <laughs> exactly. All right. Do we have any other questions for this man, Lil? Nope, not at all. But thank Salad you. Salad story, pick it up, kids. Yes. Pick it up, guys. You it's fun. Go to Amazon, but use our link in the show notes. That's yes. Right. <laughs> but yes, kids, I mean, thank you. I was always curious about, like, the uh, goings on behind the scenes of, on these crossover things, that, you know, how different it was. I think some are and... more complicated than others oh. as, as time goes on, too. So. Oh, yeah. That sweet 90s spot. Well, definitely. Exactly. Well, now it's DC or it's Disney and Warner, so now it's, I guess, it's more right, of a more right. difficult thing. Uh, all right. Before we get to your plugs, uh, I'll give you your homework for next time. Uh, I was thinking, well, you and everyone listening to this thought we, we could cover Electra, Root of Evil. Okay. All, all the whole the whole series? Yeah. Sure. What was that? Like yeah. Four issues? Yeah. Four issues. Yeah. Okay. That sounds like a good one. All I'll right. get my I'll get my ninja costume out, and we'll we'll go from there. All right, Mister Terrific, where can people find you and all your stuff? <laughs> um, thanks again, guys, for the invite. This is always fun. Uh, please check out StoryMaze.substack.com uh, for my newsletter and uh, lots of backgrounds on comics like Batman and Daredevil and other things, as well as uh, new writing and ideas about writing and just fun writing altogether. So please check that out. All right.
All right, kids. Yes. If you have any questions for Mr. Chichester, send them capes and lunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail 614-382-2737. That's 614-38capes. Or just get a hold of us on social media. Find links to all of that. You can watch this video on our YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, everything's at Linktree, L A N K T R dot E E slash capes and lunatics. All right. I believe that's it. Again, thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure. You guys have a great weekend. Take it easy. Hey, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.